This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace. Everything you need to create an exceptional website. For a free trial and 10% off your first order, visit squarespace.com and use the offer code MACVOICES8. Welcome to the Mac Jury on Mac Voices. This is the home of truth, justice, and the Macintosh way. I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it's been a little while since we convened a Mac jury, but we have a topic tonight that I think is, well, it's a series of topics, I guess. We're going to be talking about open source, open standards versus closed and proprietary standards, uh, the patent system and, and where it figures into that. Because I, at least I find myself somewhat conflicted because one minute I feel like I'm advocating and rooting for open standards and, and open things. The next minute, I really like the idea of proprietary closed things. And of course, there's that little detail about how businesses look at some of this stuff and, and what they try to do to support it or to lock you in. And I couldn't think of a better panel than the one we have. So let's go around the room and find out who we're going to talk to tonight. First up, it's it's been a long time since we've seen him either here or even online. Chuck Latornos, where have you been hiding? <laughs> I joined the witness protection program because of some patent infringements that I've no. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's just life gets in the way sometimes, and uh, it's been a pretty busy summer for me. But I'm I'm back. I'm trying to kind of reappear. I even have a piece coming up in the Mac Observer of all things um, in the next week or so. So I'm um, trying to get my feet back into the technology business and see what I've missed during my self-imposed exile. So I am Chuck Latornis. I'm a contributing editor for the Mac Observer, which I will prove, as I said, shortly by posting something. <laughs> and I also uh, I run a website that's sort of the intersection between technology and the great outdoors, and that's called trailcamper.com. Terrific. It's good to have you back. We, we've missed you. Missed you, too. <laughs> the ever-present, always welcome, Mr. Peter Cohen is joining us. Peter, it's great to see you. Thank you very much, Chuck. So I um, am executive editor over at The Loop, loopinsight.com, where I work with Jim Dalrymple. Um, I uh, am managing editor um, at imore.com, um, and... Uh, I also do a lot of freelance work for anybody whose paychecks don't bounce. <laughs> Always <laughs> and, a good measurement, Peter. <laughs> and then um, on the weekends, I also uh, put in a few hours at my local Apple specialist. So I'm a uh, Apple sales professional on top of all that, too. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H. Great. Peter, I think it's, it's really cool the way... Um Renee Ritchie and Jim Dalrymple share you. That's not always something that is possible to do, especially in uh, other than just contributing positions. So I, th I think that's very cool. It gives you different places to display different aspects of your of your talents. Yeah, I feel kind of like that guy in prison that gets passed around. But no, just kidding. Uh, they, they, they work it out really, really uh, effectively because they're both Canadians and they're both inherently polite people. So uh, uh, the, the shared custody arrangement is working out marvelously. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have come up with several of those examples. So <laughs> just going to move on. Uh, last but absolutely not least, uh, joining us uh, again. He hasn't been here for a while, but then we haven't been here for a while. Wow. Mr. Weldon Dodd, it's, it's great to see you, Weldon. Thanks for coming back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chuck. It's great to be here. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm the proprietor of Rewind Technology in Littleton, Colorado. We're an Apple-authorized training center in the Rocky Mountain region. And, uh, you know, I was just teaching a class this morning, so hopefully I haven't used up my whole voice today lecturing about uh, OS X and all the details there. You, you, if you want, you can find me at rewindtech.com if you're interested in uh, the business aspect. I'm on Twitter at Weldon. Great. I, I was about to ask what's hot in the training business, but I know what's about to be hot in the training business, and that's going to be Mavericks yeah. and iOS 7. Yeah, the, the breakneck pace of OS releases has been pretty tough on the training team, actually. You know, the, the yearly cycle has uh, made it tough to keep up with the training materials, but we do our best. People definitely want it. Weldon, well, do you typically work with more advanced users, or is it more the, for lack of a better phrase, the common man? 
A little bit of both. Most of our business is focused on training IT professionals. So a lot of the people we get coming through class are Windows admins, and they've been in IT for a while, but they're new to the Mac, and so they need a little uh, grounding on how to work with OS X, how the internals work. So we take them through the operating system and, and prepare them you know, to work in that career or uh, also to get Apple certification if they're interested in that. Great, great. Well, folks, please check it out if, uh, if you're in the area. It's always as, as good as the, all the online training is. There's still something about hands-on and a person to ask a question to right there in front of you that's, that's good. So, gentlemen, you heard my introduction. Uh, I, I, and I, I guess, you know, where do we start? I guess the, the easiest place to start here to dive into this may be the, the Apple ecosystem, mainly the, the iTunes store. Uh, the debate between iOS as a closed system with an alleged lock-in versus Android, which is open source and is reputedly fraught with viruses and security issues and all kinds of things. And, and I don't think I'm spreading fear, uncertainty, and doubt there. I think that's reasonably accurate. Weldon, how about if we start with you? Um, any, any thoughts on this? Uh, yeah. I think there's a couple different aspects to the debate. You know, one is... Um, open versus closed and the terms of the way that, that Google and Apple approach the market. Um, you know, we could talk about free open source, open source software, cathedral and bazaar. You know, there's, uh, there's a lot of different aspects to it. You know, one that impacts us is, um, you know, tools that are available for, for managing computers, you know, on the Apple side, uh, walled garden, whatever you want to call it, it's a little tougher to get documentation on how things actually work. And so some of the tools are um, uh, hard to come by because we don't have all of the documentation on the, on the internals where with uh, Android or something like that, we could look at the source code and actually figure out how it works. Um, you know, that can be an issue. Um, one of the things that, you know, we try to deal with there is you know, trying to find the best tools, and, and some are cobbled together, and uh, some it takes a little while to get all the materials together. Uh, from that perspective, we would love to have more from Apple, but uh, we just don't. I have to admit, that's not an angle I'd really thought about it, the, the, the availability of information on some of these platforms. Chuck, how, how do you feel? I mean, you're not a, you're not a programmer, but that's... I guess just one aspect of it. What aspect do you attack it from? No, I'm not a programmer, but I am a scripter. So, you know, I, I think I'll weigh more in on the open standards and open source than, than, than the aspect of phone operating systems. You know, the, the old, I guess, um, the, the easy way to say it is open equals good, closed equals bad. Open is Google. They're good, free. Um, Apple is evil, controlling, walled garden, curated, all that stuff. I think that's a crock. I mean, you're curated by somebody. You're either curated by Apple and the iOS store, or you're on the Android side, you're curated by the carriers who have a lot of control over what gets on the phone, um, what what comes preloaded on your phone, what you can do with those things, unless you start getting into things like sideloading and, and rooting your device, and geekier things than most people who pick up an Android phone are interested in doing. Um, even when you talk about OS updates for Android, that's controlled by the carriers to a large extent. So when security things come out, when new features come out on, you know, honeycomb or what are ice cream sandwich or, you know, whatever dessert flavor course we're on at the moment, um, the carriers can still control whether that gets pushed out to the phone. So you, you have, because their model is they want you to refresh your phone every couple of years and, and that's where they're making their money. So, I think it's just overly simplistic to say that, that Android is open and therefore better than at the Apple ecosystem. Peter? Open I, good, closed bad? I'd rather live in a walled garden than an open sewer. <laughs> <laughs> That's it? That's <laughs> you know, uh, Apple uses a lot of open source software. Um, uh, you know, this is this is, I think, one of the fundamental fallacies of uh, you know people who kind of promote uh, uh, Android as as uh, or well, you know, as as Apple just in general is closed, whereas other things like Android are open. 
you know, Apple relies a lot on open source technology. It's incorporated into um, a lot of what OS X does, for example. And, you know, some of that carries over to iOS, although iOS is a little more locked up. So it, it aggravates me when I hear people talking about Apple as if, you know, we're still back in the classic Mac OS days, you know, the proprietary closed box. It's not exactly like that. Um, and it hasn't been like that for some time. So it's it's a, a fallacy that I just fundamentally disagree with. Yeah, and I think Apple's done a, a much better job of contributing back to the open source movement in terms of things like WebKit. You right. Know, you know, they, they put WebKit back out into the ecosystem, and now all mobile phones operate off of that. You know, whereas um, Android and Google specifically has started to really crack down. Um, you know, there's the, the famous saying, I forget who, who at Google it was who said it, but, you know, you can get Android just by writing one line of code in your terminal and you'll get the, the package and, you know, you can compile it and all that and, and you're running Android. But Google has limited what carriers and what manufacturers can get specific versions of Android unless they agree to certain conditions, which makes them at least as closed as Apple, and I'd say a lot more nefarious than Apple, who at least is saying, we're curating this because we want to make sure the phone experience stays good and the customers continue to get the best experience out of the, the operating system and the apps that run on it. To respond to what Chuck's saying, the thing that kind of annoys me about Google's position now is that they have, you know, a veneer of openness. and. Uh, you know, they've switched their model around with Android releases, you know, to talk about that specifically where, you know, it is the cathedral model. They, they only reveal the source code when it's a finished product. Uh, even now, the Nexus 7 or open source code has not been published. It's not been shared. I think part of the holdup is something to do with the Qualcomm chipset that's supported in there. And there's some proprietary technology that they don't want to include in the open source release that's been holding it up. So, you know, they talk about being open, but, you know, it's certainly not the bizarre model where it, 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 maybe it's worthwhile to explain that. But, you know, Eric Raymond wrote an uh, article a long time ago about the cathedral and the bazaar. The idea was that the cathedral, you would release the open source code for people to look at when it was finished. And then everyone could look at the release and, uh, you know, and then look for bugs and, and look at what was happening under the hood. The bizarre model, the in terms of an open market, was that the development is done in the open and everyone can look at the open source code throughout the development and find and identify bugs along the way. And so, you know, his argument was that, uh, you know, open source should be fully open, the development should be done in the open, and that leads to better software because more eyes are looking at it, find bugs along the way. Um, you know, Google has definitely shied away from that, and they've, they're taking longer and longer to contribute back to the um, their open source repositories. And uh, I don't recall the specifics, but uh, one of the community managers there who had been responsible for maintaining the open source repositories just quit uh, in a huff about the fact that Google was not releasing the open source code in a, in a forthcoming and timely way. So I, I, there's a bit of frustration on my part that, about this discussion about, you know, open is better because I'm not sure that Google is really following through on the, on the implicit promise of being open. My, I'm not a, I'm not an Android user, so I'll, I'll just say that up front. But my perception is that it's a bit of a guessing game right now if you go and get a lot of Android apps as to whether it will run on your device. Because it ha certain devices will run different flavors of the operating system. Chuck, I think you referenced that. And different apps will support different flavors on different devices. And so it just, the perception I have, and it may be inaccurate, is that it's a bit of a jumbled up mess. And unless you're just running at, at the top of the heap, whatever that is, the most, the most current hardware with the most current version of the, of the Android operating system, it's a bit of a crapshoot as to what you can run. Does anybody have any experience in that area? I, I think the bigger problem is that the... Uh, <laughs> The phone that you get, just like Chuck was mentioning, the releases are controlled by the cell phone company. So you're not going to get the updates that you need. There's you know, a significant number of Android phones that are still running. Uh, 
I was just listening to a security networking podcast this morning, and they talked about this. I'm not sure if I can get all the details, but there's a significant number of Android phones running, I think, 2.2, which has something like 250 known zero-day vulnerabilities from a web page. So if you visit a web page, they can root your phone 250 different ways. And that's not going to get fixed because the carriers aren't going to release those updates. So the primary benefit of open source is to put the code out there so people can review it and contribute fixes to it, uh, plug those security vulnerabilities. But because of the way that Android's being managed, I'm not sure that those updates are being published and, and getting out to people that actually own the devices. Peter, I know you have a lot of contact with developers. Do you get the sense, I mean, we all, well, no, I was about to say we all sort of know. I don't know. Do we know? It seems like, though, that developers favor the iOS platform because that's where the money is. Not that there isn't some money and on a lot of stuff going on on Android, but do you think that they feel that it's a superior platform for development? I think they do. I think that... Um they they do for for a few reasons. I'm not sure if it's because the actual technology is that much better, but just because the environments are that much better. Because um, as as you point out, you know iOS is still where you can make a lot of money. Um, you know, there's piracy, there's jailbreaking in iOS, but it's not as extreme an issue as the, as it is in Android. Um, people who um, have iOS devices or more inclined to spend money on the App Store than their Android counterparts. Um, but I also think that, um, d especially depending on the nature of your development, uh, hitting a large target base of users is easier on iOS than it is on Android because of the fragmentation issue. You know, there's a much larger base of um, devices running a consistent version of the operating system in a consistent way. Um, that that makes it easier to target large groups of people uh, to buy your apps. And that gets infinitely more complicated when you move into the Android environment and uh, um, all of a sudden you've got a million devices, you know, from lots of different carriers uh, that all work a little bit of an, in a different way. Um, and you have to kind of figure that out. You have to build these matrices to kind of figure out um, how exactly you're going to manage that compatibility. It's not an insurmountable problem. Um, and, uh, you know, it's certainly not as huge a problem as some in the Apple uh, uh, punditosphere have made it. But it is an issue. And for a small developer on, uh, you know, of limited means, it's it, it becomes a problem. But most of the developers that I talk to have their feet in both worlds. They, they, they work in iOS and they work in Android, too. And they can't afford not to. You know, it's not like there are a lot of iOS exclusive um, apps out there. There's certainly some, but the exception, they're the exception that proves the rule. But from what I've heard, Peter, it, the developers find it harder to keep up with the Android side for much the same reason that back in the old days that, that Windows developers had a bit of a challenge because you've got different cameras to support, you've got different hardware to support that's that's on board on those things. Just like on PCs, you know, you had all kind of controllers and graphics cards and all that. And on the iOS, you have, a, you, yeah, you have a smaller selection, but you also have a selection that is manageable, that all the standards are published, all the specs are published, and you know what you have to do. That's right. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely true. And I, I don't want to discount uh, that fragmentation is an issue. It's just not, you know, uh, a, an insurmountable issue. It's something that, that can be overcome carefully. Um, and, it, you know, the, the, obviously you're interested, regardless of what the platform is, in hitting the biggest target possible. But, uh, you know, if you take a look at Apple's own statistics, uh, something like 60% of its installed base was running iOS 6 at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, that, that gives... Um, iOS developers, a practical install base of something like 200 million users um, uh, to, to, to uh, or no, 300 million users to work from. Um, so, uh, you know, the, 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 the issue is a lot less um, present on iOS, and I think that that's a big selling point um, to, to do development, especially initial development for a company that's just dipping its feet in the mobile waters. Um, uh, for iOS instead of Android. 
I, th I think that's a really good point. The fragmentation, fragmentation issue is big. Um, but I think even beyond that, a lot of Android users are using their phones as feature phones. That's and right. Not really, and not really getting into the, the app aspect of it at all. And it's because Android can be included on phones for, you know, at no, virtually no cost to the, to the, the phone manufacturers. Um, and, and so I think, a, you know, a large number of people, Peter referenced the studies, um, a great percent, the greatest percentage of money being spent on apps and time being spent on the web is coming from iOS devices, even though just by pure numbers, they're a smaller market share than Android at this point. But forgive me for maybe stating the obvious, but why would anybody spend the money for some of these things unless they're either A, heavily subsidized, or B, they, they, well, I guess that they don't intend to use them as anything but feature phones? Is well, a lot, of the, a lot of the Android phones you don't have to spend money on anymore. Is, is you know, a lot of them are, are free with contract, free with two-year contract, or $49, or, you know, or whatever it is, which is still a lot better or a lot more affordable, you know, people see it, than the $300 minimum you're going to have to spend on a new iPhone. Chuck's absolutely right. You can get um, even unsubsidized Android phones for, uh, you know, 100 bucks. So uh, it's possible for people to pick these devices up, and, and they're not looking at them in terms of what version of, of Android OS am I running or uh, what apps can I get? Can I play Angry Birds on this thing specifically? They're just looking at it as a new phone and, oh, yeah, you know, I mean, look, as a practical example, like, consumers just ain't that discriminating, right? <laughs> uh, as a practical example, like, the, the store that I work at on the weekends, you know, we've got an iPad and an iPad mini set up near the front uh, of the store. It's one of the first things you see when you walk in the door. It's impossible to miss, although a lot of people bless their hearts, too. And every so often, we'll get somebody walking in who sees the iPad mini for the first time and says, oh, what's that? It's an iPad mini. Oh, I have an iPad mini. It's made by Kindle. Right. <laughs> yes. You know, we, we laugh because it's ludicrous, but really, I mean, that's how people think of these things. You know, they, they don't really recognize them for their intricacies that we sort of take it take for granted. They they just look indiscriminately at these things and assume that they're all alike. It's um, becoming a generic term like Kleenex. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. But more to the point, you know, they're, they're not thinking critically about what they've got in their hands. All they know is that I have this thing and it does things. Um, and, and, you know, an Android phone from that perspective is, uh, is that for a lot of users. It's, it's a thing that, that makes calls and that I can get texts on, but I may only use the applications that come with the phone. I may never go to the Google Play Store and download stuff for it. I may not even know what that is, and I don't care yep. because I paid a hundred bucks for this, and you know I'm 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 getting charged seventy bucks a month, you know, by by Verizon for using it, and I don't really want to get charged a lot more money, and I'm afraid that anything that I do want it is going to cost me money. You know, their Ma and Pa Kettle just aren't that sophisticated, and they don't really want to be bothered with the intricacies of these things either because, you know what, at the end of the day, it's not that important to them. They're more interested in who's going to be on Wheel of Fortune that night <laughs> or, you know, what's on Inside Edition. They really don't give a damn about their phones. Yeah. And, you know, this, the simpler answer, Chuck, may be that have you tried to buy a feature phone lately? They're almost non-existent. I think, um, you know, my wife does not want a smartphone. She, in her words, she wants a phone where she can pick it up and say, hello, and that's it. And we went to the, uh, you know, our local AT&T store to try to get her a new feature phone, and we had a whopping choice of one. Oh. And everything yeah. else was either an Android or a Windows phone or, or an iPhone. I did the exact same thing last year, Chuck. I actually got fed up with AT&T and said, the hell with it, I'm not paying these bastards anymore. And I went out and I bought the cheapest feature phone that I could. It's a little Kyocera um, thing. I forget which model it is, but it, it made calls. And after a fashion, it could text if you didn't mind <laughs> typing T9 on the keypad. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it was an absolute miserable experience to use for, for anything but making calls. But my point was, I don't want to spend money on this crap anymore. You know, I was tired of tithing, literally, to <laughs> AT&T every month. And I just, I wanted to get out of it. I got dragged back into it this past April. And, you know, I got an iPhone 5. But um, 
it was a really interesting experience having that dumb phone because I actually wrote about it for the loop. And I was amazed at the level of hostility that I got from our readers over my decision to do that uh, because I, they couldn't believe that I was such a Luddite. You know, how can you even think to speak authoritar- uh, authoritatively about this stuff if you don't own one? You know, look, I, I don't play a musical instrument, but I don't hesitate to, you know, offer my critical opinion of new albums that I get. You know, does that make me a bad person? No, you, you don't need to be use this this stuff day in and day out to have an educated uh, opinion about it. Um, you know, same with a lot of things. But, uh, you know, people uh, in, in our little corner of the world have gotten so wrapped up in this that um, I think that we lose perspective sometimes. And I, that's evident, you know, every time you see an Android versus iOS flame war erupt on a, a tech site, you know, here, hither and yon. You know, it's incredible the vitriol, especially in my opinion, that Android users uh, project uh, onto iOS users for their choice of phones. It's just, it's appalling to me. It, I, am I wrong, guys? I, do, you, do you not see, I, I don't see iOS people going out of their way to crap on Android users, but I see Android users trolling iOS users all the damn time. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. And and sometimes it's sort of, you get the feeling of the disgruntled lover or the person who's intentionally bucking against the tide. And, you know, um, I, well, and part of it is now is iPhones are for old people. At least that's, I think what Samsung is trying to, <laughs> to engender among us. But, um, but I do see some evidence of that. You know, the iPhone's my father's phone and, and now I'm going to get this Samsung Galaxy 7 with the, you know, giant phablet, which is a term that I just can't stand either. Fablet. <laughs> well, then, I, I have to admit these two have educated me a little bit. So I'm sitting here thinking God, that, that's a terrifying thought. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. But, but I guess I'm sitting here thinking about Tim Cook's uh, regular assertions that the iOS is delivering so much more web traffic, and so yeah. if if someone is buying an Android phone. As a, as the only as a choice, as a free choice, as opposed to maybe a feature phone, mm-hmm. does that account for some of the sales numbers we're seeing from Android, but the lack of, of apparent use, the way that we all would think of ourselves using our our phones? I, it seems to be a good guess. I, I don't know. I mean, can you get an Android phone without a data plan? Does anybody know? Not that I've been able to find. Yeah, so I mean, so you have to assume that people that have all these phones have data plans that are available to them, and certainly they could use Wi-Fi anytime they were in range of, of Wi-Fi, but they're just not using them. So, I, you know, I have to agree with kind of what Peter and Chuck were saying earlier, that people are getting them because they're free, or it's the low-cost option. When they go to get their new phone, um, you know, that's the cheapest option available. It looks like a smartphone, it, you know, kind of talks like a smartphone, Um Maybe it doesn't quite walk like a smartphone the way with, that we would like it to, but uh, so they have one, but they don't, but they don't use it. I, I suppose going back to the argument about open versus close, that maybe this is a win for open, right? The fact that Android is open source and that carriers can use it um, somewhat free of charge, it's enabled this low cost market for essentially really cheap smartphones. And uh, that's something that maybe would not have been possible without the fact that Android is available for free. You just said something interesting, though, that people using these phones. Is it, do you think it's something that, I, well, it's time for me to get a new phone, so I'll buy a smartphone. And, yeah, I can get this one over here for, you know, nothing or $5. And so that's the one I'll take, even though it won't fit in my pocket you know, or my jacket pocket or my purse yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And and yeah. then they just never get around to using it. Whereas iPhone users and, and, and purchasers focus on being able to use it, that they, maybe they're already part of the Apple ecosystem or it's just an easier device to set up and use. I mean, or am I just sounding like an Apple fanboy? I, I think you're giving people too much credit saying that they go into the store and say, I want to buy a smartphone. I think they say, I just want to buy a new phone. 
and the smartphones are what are there, you know, as we said before, and often they're now either free or, you know, very, very cheap. And somebody sa- sees something that costs less and has a bigger screen. So, oh, golly, it must be better. Well, you just said when you went to the store, you had one non-smartphone choice, right? Right. And, and how many other choices were there? 20? Oh, lots. Sure. Yeah. So, just from that perspective, I think the whole consumer base is going to roll over eventually to something that has Android on it. Right. And if my choice is between free phones, is this little tiny thing with a small screen and no keyboard, and this other thing with a big, giant, colorful screen and touch, touch screen capabilities and all that, well, you know, that's, that's the choice I'm going to make, even if I never do launch Angry Birds on it or, or surf the web. Hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know if there's an answer here, but it does seem like there's some de- very definite, compelling arguments for iPhone users if you intend to really become a smartphone user. I, I thought there was an interesting um, story that came out. I think it was on Dar- Daring Fireball, maybe just even today or yesterday, um, that said a, high, a much higher percentage of second-time smartphone buyers were buying Apple phones, iPhones, and uh, it was a higher percentage of people who bought for the first time who were buying the Androids. So, you know, maybe people are getting smart after they've gotten through the, the Android experience for a while. And uh, when they go back to do it again, they're moving up to an iPhone. Yeah, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Right. I'm curious, guys, and this is a, ta- a related tangent. Does anybody here really believe in the, the lock-in, at least, at least for the first year, maybe, that I've, I buy so many apps or whatever that I'm just locked in and I can never change my platform? Yeah, actually, I do. Uh, really? You know, I think that, that um, uh, again, people who uh, maybe, you know, are, are, are less familiar with the technology are more inclined um, to just go with the flow once they've got a workflow set up because, you know, okay, all my pictures are on this thing, all my music is on this thing. I'm surprised consistently by the people walking in the door to our store who have no idea that, for example, that they can re-download their music from iTunes without getting charged twice for it. You know, they come in with a locked phone. Oh, my God, you know, what, what can I do? Well, I can unlock it for you. You know, that means resetting it to a factory condition. Oh, my music's going to be gone. I'm going to have to buy everything over again. No, you don't. You just redownload it. It's free if you bought it from iTunes. Oh, okay. All right, great. Go ahead and do it. You know, again, people, uh, a lot of people out there, a lot of big, big strata, stratus of, of, of consumers are just not sophisticated enough to know how the technology works and get scared of these things. And that's why that's, I think part of what keeps them in the ecosystems that they're already in. Um, you know, especially if you, you buy a few apps or, um, uh, you use the features of the, of the phone that kind of compel you to into the cloud services that, uh, each of these different phone platforms is relying on, whether that's iCloud or, uh, you know, Google's, uh, cloud services, um, it, it, it becomes a compelling reason for you to continue using it after you've gotten dependent on it. So I do definitely think that there's, uh, there's that effect out there. Yeah. I'm not sure that we are the typical users, but I agree with Peter. I mean, in my case, I've gotten, I've, I have hundreds of dollars sunk into apps that I've purchased for my iPhone. And that would definitely be a consideration for me to switch platforms. If, if Windows phone, you know, suddenly became, um, very compelling to me, and I wanted to make a switch. I would probably still do it over time, but the fact that I'd have to rebuy a lot of apps would definitely be a factor. A lot of them are free. I mean, you can get you know your Facebook and Twitter and all that kind of stuff, um, and maybe that's more where the typical user is, where they could just re-download the free apps that they're using, and it, and it wouldn't be as painful. But um, I think for people who spend a lot of money on their apps, and I've certainly spent more on iOS apps than I have on Mac apps over the last five years, um, I, I think it would be a, something to take into consideration. In our household, we, I've, got, uh, I've got a lot of kids, but I have, I have uh, three teenagers at home, and they all have iPhones. My wife and I have iPhones. We have iPads in the house. So just the fact that we can buy the app once, and now everybody can use that same app, uh, really does has a, have us 
locked in, if you will. But uh, we're doing it willingly. We're, we're quite happy to be locked into the situation where we can buy an app once and you know all five iPhones can use that same app. Uh, that's great for us. The same thing with our music library. We have it set up on an iMac in the house, and everybody can upload their music. And, uh, you know, the kids generally like the same kind of music, so they want same songs on their playlist. They don't have to buy it twice. It's, that part works great for us. We're quite happy about it. I, guys, again, I really don't know. Is Can you set up a single Android ID and share apps among a family like you are welding? Is that is that possible, or does every single... Android device have to have its own ID and therefore download its own apps, pay for or paid for or not. I've not used the Google Play Store for myself, but I assume that you could log in from multiple devices with the same account. Yeah. Yeah, I think you can, and I'm almost certain you can do that on the Amazon store. Yeah, I think you can. I think I, you definitely can on the Amazon store because they do such a great job of tying it to your ID. And so right. if I own multiple Kindles, for example, you know, they don't have a problem with that. Right. I can sync things to every single Kindle I own if I want. Including the Kindle app on your iPad. Exactly. Exactly. This edition of Mac Voices is brought to you by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code MACVOICES8. You've built your Squarespace site. You saved 10% by using the code MACVOICES8. Now what? Let me know about your experience with Squarespace. I haven't heard from anyone who wasn't completely satisfied with their Squarespace experience, and I'd like to share your story with our listeners and viewers. Tell me what you built and why you love Squarespace by sending an email to chuck at macvoices.com, and you might just appear on a future edition of Mac Voices. I've told you all about Squarespace's customizable templates that let you create a great-looking website immediately, but also let you customize it so that it looks exactly the way you want, and not like anyone else's site. You have complete control if you want it. I've also talked about Squarespace's amazing support crew, on deck 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, to help you get the answers you need quickly. They know your site is important to you, and want to make sure you get the service you need when you want it. This time, let's talk a little bit about some of the under-the-hood features, things you might never need to know about except to know they are there working on your behalf. Things like the code to your website that you never see unless you want to. Squarespace makes sure the code is clean and simple, ready to be crawled by Google, Yahoo, Bing, and all other search engines. That means that people looking for you will find you. And on an ever more crowded internet, that's more important than ever or the ever-popular automatic imagery sizing, so that your site and your images look great no matter what device, mobile or desktop, your visitors surf in on. That too is more important than ever, and it doesn't get any easier to implement than on Squarespace. Yes, boys and girls, all that and much, much more is waiting for you at squarespace.com. Why not take advantage of their 14-day free trial, no credit card required, and when you're ready to purchase, use our code MACVOICES8 to save 10%, and to show your support of Mac Voices. That's discount code Mac Voices 8 to save 10% and to let them know you heard about them on Mac Voices. Squarespace, everything you need to create an exceptional website. Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this edition of Mac Voices. Let's shift gears here and, and again take off on another, another direction. The the debate right now are the issues going on over television, um, and and certainly this has been in the news as we record this, with CBS going dark on one of the major cable systems because they, you know, they couldn't come to terms, and I was looking at tweets last night, all kind of angry tweets that, you know, I want this, I want that, and it's it, on CBS and I can't get it anymore. Now I'm the first one to tell you I'm surprised that anybody has anything on CBS other than Craig Ferguson that they want to watch. But that said, it, it, is this accelerating cord cutting, and is this another example of somebody trying to lock us into something, and we're fighting back more than we've ever been able to before? Chuck, um, I'm not a cord cutter. Um, I'm pretty, 
well entrenched in purchasing my cable TV packages. I although I get basic packages, I don't really buy premium channels. Um, other than the fact that they threw in HBO for free for me this time around, so for the first time in ten years, I have HBO, and I have to admit that I like having HBO Go on my iPad and uh, and my Mac if I want. Um, other than that, I, I don't subscribe to Netflix. I don't subscribe to Hulu+. Plus. Um, I don't have a whole lot of time for TV watching, so I'm probably not the best person to ask about this. But I do tend to think that there is a sea change coming, and I think some of the broadcasters, a very small portion of them, are finally starting to see the message. But there are some that are just so... Um, so entrenched and, and, and stubborn in their old school mentality and their old business models that they're gonna, it's going to take a lot of kicking and screaming to get them there. But, um, but something like, like this could be a, a factor. Something like, I think it's the Aero system where you're, you're actually renting a small antenna, which, which lets you uh, get over-the-air channels without having to have a, a cable subscription. Um, that's an interesting test case. Um, I think that could have a change. And in fact, uh, it's Time Warner Cable, I think, who is recommending that their subscribers who want to get CBS use the Aero service now in order, in order to, to retain CBS while they're black on, on their cable network. So the fact that now you have a media provider, content provider, or, or a, a cable uh, network at least acknowledging this as a legitimate business model I think that could help move things along too I had not heard that that's very interesting but is is it is it is this CBS's issue or is it Time Warner's issue it, it depends on who you talk to I mean I, I haven't gotten into the uh, the details of, of the arrangements but you know essentially over the air channels had always been free um, but with Cable systems paying all the other networks, you know, in order to provide their programming, they want a piece of the pie too. So who's who's being greedy? Who's being unreasonable? Um, probably everybody. It's probably a safe bet, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's in it for themselves, for sure. I mean, who's the victim here? The customers. Yeah. You know, the, the interesting thing to me is that I think, you know, looking at this, I think, from a more holistic perspective and putting the Apple twist on it, because that's what we're here is the Mac jury. Um, it's interesting to note that, you know, if, if you rewind things a year or two ago, a lot of people were hoping that the Apple TV was going to be very disruptive to... Um, this marketplace, and you know, if the, you've got Gene Munster um, from Piper Jaffrey, that analyst who has been predicting the Apple TV, <laughs> like the ap actual Apple Television, for about three years now. And if I were Tim Cook, I swear to God, I would have like a special <laughs> press conference for the fourth generation Apple Television, Apple TV, and it would be a little black box, just like the third generation Apple TV. But I would haul out like a big sixty-inch frame and cover it with a big tarpaulin, <laughs> and have Gene sitting in the front you row. You get palpitations. In <laughs> right, exactly. You know, I'm finally right. Him, yeah, just to watch him have a heart attack as I whip away the the tarp and reveal the fourth generation Apple Television. Um, you know, they were hoping that the Apple TV was going to be a real disruptive force uh, when it came to TV broadcasting. And I think that um, if you actually look at what Apple's done over the past few months uh, with the Apple TV, you see that they're taking a much more iterative approach um, to uh, working with broadcasters instead of trying to replace broadcasters. Now, replacing broadcasters may indeed be what they do long term, but they realize that for the short term, they're not going to be everybody's new cable company. Um, and uh, this is evidenced by this most recent update that they just did where they added HBO Go to the Apple TV. Now, you've been able to get HBO Go on your iPad or your iPhone or your iPod Touch for a while. And for the uninitiated, if you're watching this and you don't aren't familiar with it with HBO Go, the way that it works is that when you first sign in, you need to be authenticated by your cable company. You need to have a valid um, uh, email address that's connected with one of the service providers, one of the cable service providers, whether it's Cox, Time. Warner, DirecTV, Comcast, whatever, uh, that, that works with this 
setup, with this authentication setup, and then you need to enter your password. And once it does, and it logs you into the system and verifies that you are indeed allowed to look at HBO programming, then you can watch HBO on your iOS device or your Apple TV. It's a very convoluted system, but it requires that you already subscribe to HBO via other means. So what the hell is the point of it? It just It's another right. on-demand right. service. It's another way of watching on-demand content uh, on my, uh, my iOS device, but it doesn't replace you know, anything that I'm doing now. And uh, the, the holy grail for a lot of people um, who are looking at this stuff is a la carte service. You know, I want to pay HBO and Showtime so I can watch Game of Thrones and Dexter, but I don't really give a damn about 40 channels of ESPN. I don't want to subsidize 40 channels of ESPN. You know, I, I had to shuck and jive with Comcast to get my cable bill down to a reasonable amount, but I've got all of the premium stations, except for, I think, the movie channel, um, which is, I don't know, vaguely ironic, but it's because I like the premium content. But, you know, I have to put up with all this other crap that they're foisting on me because I have no choice. And... I, I don't think that Apple is going to break the backs of the entertainment companies uh, with the Apple TV or with anything that they're going to do because the broadcasters and the media giants that, that are behind these companies are not going to make the same mistakes that um, the, uh, the, the music industry did That's when Apple key. rolled out iTunes. You know, it's just what, it's not going to happen. Yeah, that's the key. And I was going to ask you that, Peter, as you went. I mean, do you... I think you answered the question now, but do you do you think that the rest of the media producers are now sort of on guard against what happened to the music industry with iTunes, where Apple just came in and 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 owned it? I think big media is out of its freaking mind. When you see, I mean, I, I was reading somewhere that 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 like the the the, the summer tentpole movies alone have underachieved to the tune of something like $650 million this year. They have lost over half a billion dollars on duds. And, you know, my, my fantasy is that the, the walls of these Hollywood production studios would run red with the blood of the executives that are greenlighting these pigs. But they're not! They're not, and we hear about these $100 million, $200 million movies that are coming out over the course of the, ne the next couple of years. What the hell is wrong with Hollywood? It is a fundamentally broken system. It's because where, explosions and CGI robots are expensive. Well, that's just it. Michael, Michael Bay-style like uh, explosion porn is more <laughs> sellable to these executives, especially within the context of a proven franchise, than a little... A little... $40 million rom-com, you know, or a drama, you know, heaven forbid that you actually have the next, you know, fast bender or, you know, an actual auteur, you know, behind the camera. Those people can't get their damn movies produced. Right. You know, they're, they're shooting it with, with, you know, if they're lucky, they're shooting it with red cameras that they begged, borrowed, or stealed from, you know, a local rental shop and trying to scrape together 40 grand to put their movie together with friends where they shoot it on the weekends. You know, but, uh, you know, Hollywood is a fundamentally broken system, but there is so much money. And when you have that much money, you have a huge level of risk aversion. So these people are not interested in trying out a new medium unless they can own it and unless they can control it. And they're not going to be working with Apple to break that open, especially now that, you know, the charismatic leader of Apple, Steve Jobs, is in the grave. You know, because I don't see Tim Cook going to Hollywood and cutting those kind of deals and romancing these people and sweeping them off their feet. Jobs couldn't do it. Cook is sure as hell not going to be able to do it. Yep. I suppose that's Eddie Q's job now, right? Right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, going back to you know some of the things you said there, I think that entertainment in general has become a, you know, a hit business, that the music industry is, is set up like that. You know, they're swinging for the fences and they're willing to go through, you know, a bunch of artists until they can find that one big act that really generates all the profit. Hollywood's the same way. You know, they fund a bunch of films looking for that one big hit that's going to bring in, you know, 500 million, a billion dollars. You know, they want the Avengers, right, every year. Um, TV is, is somewhat similar, but it, it doesn't feel quite as slanted to me as 
uh, movies and music do. Uh, but obviously, they're still looking for hits. You know, they cancel shows if they don't have enough viewers, and they're ready to move on to the to the next one. W- one of the things I think that's interesting in looking at how Apple could participate in this is that the the cable companies, the MSOs, actually provide uh, economic viability to small channels on the cable network. So. If, if I was talking to a friend who works for uh, one of the satellite delivery companies, he's, he's in sales, but you know he was explaining that, that we have a mountain channel here in Denver. I, I don't know who else has it or how broadly it's distributed, but you know it covers issues for the Mountain West here and outdoor life and those kinds of things. So his argument was that channel only exists because they can get it onto the basic package. And so they get whatever, you know, two cents or something for every subscriber. But because the MSO can scale so large, you know, two cents on 26 million subscribers is a big deal. And so they, it's economically viable for them to produce that content as long as they sign a deal with the cable company. But without the cable company, and it, if it's all a la carte, it actually becomes a lot tougher for some of these small independent producers to get enough money for their content. Because now they have to go, you know, ostensibly, they have to go out to individual consumers and convince them to pay for their content. And that's, that's a lot tougher road for some than just going to a cable company and negotiating a deal to get onto the, the basic package where maybe nobody watches it but they have guaranteed income. The thing I'm hoping for is, and Apple would be the one to do it because they've got the money. We've just seen Hulu develop. Is it, I think boardwalk empire. Is that the one? The, uh, that's HBO. That's it's HBO. House, house of cards. House of cards. Thank you. Sorry. House of cards. So, so they developed that through their own production company and all that. I'm waiting for Apple to maybe subsidize somebody, not necessarily, a, a, have their own production house, but set up a, an Apple TV channel where they go out and say, "Hey, give us your content. You know, sell us your content. We're going to put it on here." Does it need to be exclusive through Apple TV? I don't. I don't know. Maybe you could send it through a Roku channel as well. But put something that is is truly unique on there that adds value to the Apple TV. That maybe you'd pay for it. Maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. But it would it would be exclusively Apple content, just like House of Cards is exclusively Hulu content. Yeah. It would encourage people to buy one time the the Black Hockey Puck Apple TV, and they'd have access to that show and the next show okay. and the next one, and let yeah. it build. Just before you get letters, I want to correct myself. Uh, House of Cards is Netflix, I think, not not Hulu. Um, ah, no, but, you, and you're right. I, no, I'll correct me. I met Netflix. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, but but I, I think that's an interesting um, model and one that might work, given all the traffic that's that's coming through iTunes as it is already, and you know the numbers of uh, of viewers that some of the more popular podcasts get. But what I wonder then is, does that pit Apple as being seen as more of a competitor to the? to the media content producers and making them then less likely to cooperate with, you know, the more of the mainstream content that, that is what it would probably take to get this thing to really, you know, gain momentum. But Chuck, there, there, we've seen plenty of articles and, and I subscribe to some of the, some of the comments that Apple really did save the music industry, that the music industry was on the way out. Its sales were down, that they helped rejuvenate, the industry through the sale of singles as opposed to albums, affordable content, and of course the iPod. And I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity here to do the same thing with the iPad, the iPhone, the Apple TV, and some kind of distribution system that they could have a big chunk of. Yeah, I, I agree with you that Apple, you know, Apple did a lot to save the music industry, but it did so in spite of the music industry. And as Peter was saying, I don't think that the movie and TV executives have learned the lesson. You know, I I don't think they're convinced that that's the way that they should go because they lost a lot of a lot of control, a lot of juice to Apple. Apple's much more important now in this ecosystem. And I don't think the uh, movie people want that to happen. I I think there's a fair comparison because 
the music industry was you know built on a distribution mechanism through retail stores and physical distribution of media and when the Napster and the internet came along right it was a better way to do it and I think TV and media is kind of in the same position where the the business model and the industry was built on exclusive rights to certain spectrum you know within a geographic area where they have rights to broadcast the shows over the airwaves and now with the rise of the internet you know that distribution mechanism is no longer as convenient as the old way of doing it it's easier to do it over the internet and so the the industry i think is going to face the same essential challenge that doing it over the internet getting it from your computer is going to be easier than you know tuning in over the air and being limited to just a certain number of channels or you know subscribing to a certain package or whatever it is and for that reason, I think it's, you know, it's probably an area that's open to disruption by Apple or, and others. Yeah, I think it is too, and I'm, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate on some of the, these things, but the, the movie industry is a lot different. Its deals are much more complex than the music industry was. It's got all sorts of rules about how many days after a release, you know, a movie can be shown in hotels versus airplanes versus cable versus Netflix and all that. Um, you know, things come out of circulation for a while, go back in, and I think the movie industry has sees itself as having to protect all of these deals in order to preserve its revenue stream. So I, th I think it is ripe for, for disruption, but I think it's going to be a lot more complicated than it was in the music industry, especially now that they're sort of on guard to seeing it, you know, this coming. And it seems like, the, you know, Chuck, you bring up a great point. It seems like there's some really interesting challenges here and, and conflicts among the various monetization options for content theaters, TV, hotel rooms, uh, Blu-rays, DVDs, online downloads. You know, you go through it and it, it, I can't help but sometimes contrast all that with a time when you played in a band or somebody made a little art film and they would have paid somebody, you know, they'd have bought them a six pack of beer just to watch or listen, you know, to, and to get the attention. And now it seems like it's it's the other way about well we we want to make sure that you have to go here to get this content or have to go there to get this content, and I have to wonder if if it's not doing a disservice to the content producers themselves. Well, it's doing a disservice to everybody. It's just that <laughs> they're they're too stubborn to realize it and too afraid to change. Yeah, I think fear of change is the big thing. You know, they're they uh, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush or whatever or. You know, it, it's it's a situation where, uh, you know, they have built their entire business model around uh, this revenue structure. And um, they, they, they see a lot of downside to changing the way that they're doing things and not a lot of upside. And it scares them. And it, they're naturally disincented from wanting to make any difference. Uh, or for for wanting to change things from the way that they are, and you know, so we're we're stuck with the model that we've got at least for now. I guess, I guess, I don't know if we well, solved anything. Oh, go ahead, Chuck. I'm sorry. I was oh, just okay. going to say, they're, they're, oh. if they're afraid of change, they're just going to get steamrolled, right? I mean, look at the Washington Post sale. It, New York Times bought them for what over a billion dollars, and then they sold them for. Actually, somebody said it was negative forty million after you accounted for the fact that the the. Uh, um, the retirement pension fund, uh, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? The, the liability for the pension fund stayed with the New York Times and didn't come over with the uh, to Jeff you're, Bezos. You're thinking actually of John Henry, the owner of the Red Sox, who bought the Boston Globe. Oh, the Globe. Boston Globe. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, you would know yeah. as a as a Boston, right? right yeah. No. Exactly. Uh, and, but otherwise, your facts. But are but right. but the general the general story plays out the same, right? That uh, you know papers were slow to change and, and kind of fearful of what was coming, and they ended up just getting steamrolled, and they lost tons of, of value in terms of you know what they what those companies sold for. So I think media companies kind of face the same problem. People will still want the media, right? They, pe we still want those big movies. We still want you know, well-produced TV shows with recognizable actors and big names and all that stuff. So there's value to the content. They just have to figure out how to get it to people um, so they don't give up too much control to any one entity and that they, you know, can still get money for what they're doing. Yeah. But holding on to the way they're doing business now, I don't think is serving anybody very well. Right. You and know, until they figure it, it, it out, there's BitTorrent. And, <laughs> right. And, right. You know, Weldon, I, I want to point out something. You are absolutely right when it comes not only to, to newspapers, but to print media in general. Mm -hmm. Newspapers, magazines, book publishing, they're all going down the toilet. 
right? There's no question about it. If you if you take a look, you know, people are the the, the advertising revenue isn't there for print um, uh, like it used to be. They're they're um, you know supporting a lot of dead weight in their organizations. They've had a very difficult transition to digital. Uh, digital doesn't allow them to make money the same way. Uh, you know, advertising revenue is very different. People expect content for free online. It's just a matter of uh, of of um, uh, uh, you know, sort of a, a sea change in the way that people are getting their information. All of that stands true. But here's the difference. It costs $3 million for a 30-second advertisement during the Super Bowl. Media companies are still making a lot of money. I don't see disruption happening in media for as long as people are watching TVs. And people are in no danger of turning off their TVs, at least for another 40 years or so. You know, you talk to kids nowadays, you talk to, you know, some millennials who are in their early 20s, they may not own a TV, they may not care, they may BitTorrent or, you know, just watch what they want, but boomers and Gen Xers and, uh, uh, you know, people who are older than us, they're watching television and they still represent a huge amount of marketing revenue and a huge potential revenue pool for these companies. And for as long as that happens, you're going to see Viagra ads and Cialis ads and Nexium ads and, you know, pharma companies shelling out tens of millions of dollars, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to advertise their products. And, you know, companies trying to sell lifestyle brands and companies like Toyota and Honda, they are going to continue to shovel huge amounts of revenue at these media companies to advertise uh, to their customers or to embed their products um, in the shows that, the, that they're watching and, you know, to, to do, uh, um, uh, to get their brands out any way that they can. That is, we're still a long way off from replacing that medium uh, the same way that newspapers are going downhill. You know, I, I, I don't think that, that we're at a disruption point. I don't think that we're anything close to a disruption point yet for as long as um, all those folks are still, you know, sitting there with a remote control in their hands watching television. Peter, I wish I could disagree, but... Th- the number of people, the, the viewership that they claim that the reality TV shows gets is just staggering to me and continues to be. I, I, I don't – and I guess just because it, there's that lean back thing where they don't want to lean forward and, you know, be selective. They just want to scan a couple channels and get something mindless to to watch. You know, it's really funny actually. When you, I mean, Do you guys remember Max Hedrum from the 1980s? Oh, yeah. Sure. It's weird how prescient – that show has been in many ways. I was watching it actually on DVD a few months ago, and I, I was really surprised at, at how well they nailed, you know, Network 23 is really sort of the model for the way that a lot of these cable uh, uh, broadcasters work. But in fairness, there is a lot of really good content on television. I don't go to the movies that often, but I watch TV almost every night of the week, and I have my DVR stacked with shows that I want to watch. And it doesn't matter whether it's summer, spring, fall, or winter. There is stuff on, and it's stuff worth watching. And it's whether it's imported from, from the U.K., or uh, whether it's it's stuff that's on basic cable, uh, like FX. You know, FX has shows like Justified and Sons of Anarchy, and they're showing The Bridge right now, which is fabulous. And you've got AMC with Mad Men and uh, Breaking Bad. And, uh, you know, then you get into the, the, the premium channels, and you've got the Game of Thrones stuff, and uh, uh, Dexter, like I was saying before, and uh, Ray Donovan, you know, which is my new jam on Showtime. There is so much good quality television to watch nowadays, it's a little ridiculous but you know what you didn't mention peter the broadcast networks the big four (laughs) well you know actually in fairness i watch a lot of that stuff too i mean maybe the stuff doesn't stick out in my mind as much but there's still stuff that i love there like um falling skies for example and yeah i did actually i mean okay the 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 actual traditional broadcasting companies revolution was a sci-fi show that i absolutely loved last season you know that was a terrific show. Yep. Uh, I watch some shows on uh, um, on on Fox. I watch um, uh, some shows on on NBC, and I watch shows on PBS. Downton Abbey. You know, so I think I think that there's still a place for broadcasters in in the grand scheme of things, as long as they're doing smart, interesting content. You know, yeah. But, but I do I do like 
I, I do the, like the, the fact, though, that uh, that the broadcasters are no longer the places where you need to go to watch the good stuff, the big budget stuff. You know, a lot of int really interesting stuff is going on on the basic cable channels now. Smart stuff that kind of gets around the the Michael Bay mentality by giving stuff that appeals to your 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 head and not just you know your appetite for explosions. And this is an excellent point, and it it it, it kind of it, it it segues into the the last point that I wanted to make, which is one thing that I can say for certain is that because we have so many options now for entertainment on television, it's balkanized, it's fragmented um, the the audience terribly because you know, we're never going to see a mash finale market share or a friend or a a, a a Cheers finale market share again. Those days are behind us. Right. Because there's so many more options for people. Um, and, uh, you know, that does mean some disruption specifically for the traditional broadcasters. It's the traditional bar broadcasters who are suffering with this. They're losing uh, viewership to uh, the, the basic cable channels and to the premium cable channels. And, you know, that's, that's where I would agree with Weldon about, you know, this, this change that's a little bit like what's happening with, with newspapers and magazines. Uh, but... You know, I don't think that that um, things are going to change that much for as long as Viacom, you know, Universal, and uh, these other companies are in the picture. They're just they're they're too big, and their um, uh, the, their hands are are spread too widely um, to to let this stuff slip through their fingers. Yeah, and now that you say that, I wonder if this sort of dispersion of the quality content across so many different networks and and distribution channels is is maybe even insulating the cable companies and and big media against the dis kind of disruption that happened in the music industry because it's it, it's got to be hard to recreate the the ability to get all that content across all this this wide spectrum of sources in an Apple TV or in a Roku box or or IPTV somehow well, that's that's what makes um, the the secondary viewing market so interesting. I mean, the DVD market has completely evaporated, and Blu-ray didn't replace it. You know, the big media companies are expecting Blu-ray to come along and and kind of supplant what they were doing with DVDs, but people really didn't buy into it because. At that point, streaming broadcasting became a, 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 a reality. Blockbuster cratered and was kind of replaced with Redbox, but really what it was replaced with was Netflix streaming. So the secondary viewing market has become that much more important for the big media companies. So you've got companies um, uh, you know, trying to figure out ways to get uh, people to watch their shows. Now, some people are going to be uh, happy renting it you know, from iTunes or from Amazon or whatever. Other people are going to want the content for free some other way. And that's where the on-demand services through the cable companies, I think, come in so handy. That's how I catch up on shows that I didn't get a chance to watch when they were broadcast the first time around. Yeah, you know? my favorite thing about HBO Go is not the fact that I can now watch HBO on my Apple TV. Who cares? I could just tune in HBO. It's the idea that now I have access to a much wider range of programming than what's available to me at any particular time on, through my cable network. That's right. Yep. People really want this content. I think what's going to work against them is it's kind of like the flow of water. It's going to find the path of least resistance. So whatever whatever gets the content to people faster and easier and better and cheaper is going to win in the long run. And and so that that creates that opening maybe for for a change in the way the um, model set up now. If Apple can figure it out, if somebody can figure it out, uh, I think they stand to make a lot of money because there's definitely demand for all that. Weldon, I want to wrap up with, with a question to you, but one thing I'd love to see is for Hulu, for Netflix, how much of their content is accessed that is maybe more than a year, more than two years old? In other words, more than a season or two seasons old. I just wonder how, how great the appetite is for that archived material versus the current. And I don't know exactly what they would, that would tell us, but I think it might tell us something. But well, no. One day, ask you. You say, you say you have a house full of kids. How do your kids feel about TV? How do they consume TV, or do uh, they? They no. They they watch a fair amount of TV. Um, I, I think it's far less than you know the average American, at least from the studies I've seen. But but they but they definitely watch TV, and uh, they get shows from Disney and Nickelodeon and other things that, that they like. But <clears throat> the way that we consume TV is through the DVR. So they program what shows they want to watch, and they just queue up on the on the TiVo, and then 
they sit down and they pick something they want to watch and they when it's over you know they put it away they skip through the commercials and and they're done so we we have shows that we watch as a family you know some of the reality tv like american idol we've watched for a long time together as a family and, and we've enjoyed that but we don't necessarily watch it when it's on when it's being broadcast we watch it when we want to sit down together and and then pick it from the list in the dvr so uh yeah i don't i don't think there's any end to the demand to consume all this media but the way that we do it and the way the when we do it i think that's going to change interesting interesting and i can't help but draw a a, a parallel between the D, the tivo and netflix as far as you know on demand what you want to watch it's there it's there when you want to watch it it's just yeah. that you have to be, happen to be capturing it just as it goes out and is is broadcast live so but it wouldn't yeah, matter yeah my kids to you. are definitely grow, growing up in this environment where they go to a box and they pick the show they want to watch and then it plays and uh, you know they're vaguely aware of the fact that we subscribe to cable and we have access to these channels and and they have to program it to record shows that come on at a certain time but honestly they're growing up in this environment where they just go to a box and pick a show and it plays and so whether that's Netflix or Roku or Apple TV or a TiVo you know they're going to grow up not really caring how that's delivered they just want to pick their show and watch it you know, it's funny. I, I've got uh, three teenage kids, um, uh, like 18 to 13, and we were really early adopters of DVR technology. We had DVRs in our house before a lot of other people in the neighborhood did. So my kids, um, I think probably from the time that they were about oh, like seven or eight, had um, my, like my oldest was seven or eight, about 10 years ago, had uh, DVRs. And I'll never forget one day my daughter uh, was just sitting there frustratedly jamming the fast forward button on the remote control. And I'm like, what's wrong? And she's like, it's broken. And I'm like, well, why, why do you think that it's broken? And she's like, cause I can't fast forward through the commercials. And I'm like, honey, you're watching live TV. What do you mean live TV? She just <laughs> couldn't wrap her head around the concept. You know, she's so accustomed to just zapping through ads that, uh, yeah. You know, the, the idea of actually watching something when it was scheduled to actually play was completely beyond her frame of reference. So, yeah, you know, Weldon's absolutely right. That's how kids are growing up today. Yep, yep. I have a vague recollection, that, a vague awareness that Falling Skies is on Sunday nights and Person of Interest is on Thursday nights. But other than that, I have no idea when anything airs anymore because it just doesn't matter. Well, you know, it's you also because we're getting old. You put up. Well, that's it's true. I mean, you know, it's, I'm surprised I remembered to come down for this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> oh, guys, this has been fun. I, I'm not sure we solved anything, but it's been a lot of fun and it's been interesting. Uh, and, and we'll definitely do it again. Chuck Latornos, Peter Cohen, Weldon Dodd, thank you for serving on the Mac Jury. Again, we'll, we'll, we will do it again, and it's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks. Yeah, it's great to be here. Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is the Home of Truth, Justice, and the Macintosh Way. As always, the verdict is in. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for links, show notes, to subscribe, to connect with Chuck on Twitter, app.net, Google+, Facebook, and for more Apple, Mac, and tech-related shows, including Mac Voices, Mac Notables, the Mac Jury, and the Mac Voices Briefing. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com.